It is good to be a little more like Jesus and a little less like me. My wife says amen to that every day. If you got your Bibles uh, or an app or if you just want to turn to your, our screen here, I want to encourage you to find yourself in Judges chapter 14 this morning. Judges chapter 14. We're continuing to follow the story of Samson. And Samson is going to offer us several interesting details of his life that will hopefully be a blessing to our lives. The number one thing we're going to pull out of our message this morning is that failure to consult the Lord regularly through prayer and through Bible study, but failure to consult the Lord regularly leads to a series in our lives of unwise decisions that if continued on will negatively impact our lives. During the Battle of the Wilderness in the Civil War, Union General John Sedgwick was inspecting his troops, and at one point he came to a parapet over which he gazed out in the direction of the enemy. And his officer suggested that it was unwise for him to be doing that. He should probably duck while passing those parapets. And he says, nonsense. They couldn't hit an elephant at this dip. And a bullet hit him. And he fell to the ground dead. See, I've found in my life that without intervention... Unwise decisions usually lead to more unwise decisions. You ever thought about that? Just look at a particular episode in your life, a series where you you come to a place and you're like, man, this really stinks to be here. Look how you got there, usually. And the older I get, the more I realize that the unwise decisions that I make in my life always stem from me not consulting the Lord on the course of my life. I can tell you, I can look back at every single major mess up in my life, every single major act of sin in my life, and I can humbly and I can confidently tell you that they took place either because I failed to go to the Lord or I failed to take the advice given to me from the Lord during my time of stress, trial, or temptation. It does not take many unwise decisions in our lives to have a negative impact in our lives. And today, as we continue to follow the story of the last judge, Samson, we're going to continue to see how his unwise decisions lead to more unwise decisions, which lead to trouble for a lot of people. In his story, I want want us to kind of peel back the layers of our hearts and ourselves and, and maybe see ourselves in the context of Samson this morning. See, it's easy to be removed from a situation. It's easy to to step back. It's easy to look inwards or look backwards or or, or look on someone else's life or situation. Remove from it and and say what we would or what we would not do. I want to encourage us this morning to recognize our own times of foolishness, our own times of sin, our own times of of pride, of, of selfishness. And I want to encourage you to see in Samson's foolishness and sin how even in the midst of his ignorance, even in the the midst of him doing exactly what he wanted to do, doing exactly what God said not to do, even in that, God is gracious in his life. And he redeems Samson and even redeems his dumb decisions. Thank God that he can redeem dumb decisions. I'm going to say that was amen for me personally, Holly. I'm glad you identified with it. And I hope you heard that. And that's what I really want you to lean into this morning. God can redeem your unwise decisions. God can redeem your sin for his purposes and his glory. And the way that takes place in our lives is once we realize we made a decision that is opposite of what God wants for us. Once we realize we've taken the Bible and laid it aside and allow our selfishness and pride to ruin the day. Once once that conviction is set in, once we realize that, we turn to Christ And he can begin to renew us from that point on. And may this story of Samson in Judges 14 help us to do that. Father God, as we turn our attention to your word this morning, that you would open our heart, that you would speak to us by the power of your Holy Spirit during these next few moments. It's in Jesus' name we thank you and pray. Amen. I want want you to see a lustful desire battling against sound advice. Look at verse 1. Through three, verses one through three of, Sam, of uh, Judges 14, excuse me. Then Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. 
So he came back and told his father and mother, I saw a woman in Timna, one of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as a wife. That's an interesting way to put that, isn't it? Then his father and mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all of our people that you go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she looks good to me. From the end of chapter 13 to the opening of chapter 14, we see Samson has gone from being born. Now he's a full-grown adult. The author doesn't give us many details about his life, but he does tell us. And what it shocks us, I think, once again, is the impact that the pagan Philistine culture. This was a culture they didn't have anything to do with God. They didn't recognize him. They, 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 they had you know, polytheism. They, they worshiped many gods, many different things. There's idols all around. And it's shocking to me to see how Israel, who was supposed to be dedicated to the one true God, who was supposed to be set apart, who was supposed to worship only God, how they so quickly allowed themselves to be engulfed in this idolatry pagan culture and they didn't see a problem with it Samson think about this Samson is a Nazarite he has been set apart from birth from birth he is supposed to be being taught that he is to do something for God yet he thought nothing of going to a place that God said don't go to he thought nothing of going to a people God said don't have anything to do with he thought nothing of going there and 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 looking for a woman And the reason this was prohibited is that at that time, God wanted Israel to live out a life and flourish as a nation and not be polluted with pagan, idolatrous culture. And we're going to see throughout Samson's life, his lustful eyes cause him much pain and much heartache. He's by far, as, we're, as we have read through all the book of Judges so far, he is by far the most flawed judge. He's violent, he's impulsive. He's sexually addictive. He's emotionally immature. And and look what happens. Just in these three short verses, we see quite a few things. Samson goes somewhere he didn't need to go. He sees something he didn't need to see. He makes a decision he doesn't need to make. He, he, He takes advice. He doesn't take advice. He should take. And he gets in trouble when he doesn't need to get in trouble. Has anybody ever done those things? Never, right? His parents, no doubt. I mean, think about this. When when Samson comes to his mom and dad and says, hey, I want a woman from the Philistines. I found this woman. I want her to be my wife. His parents had to take a step back and it's like, whoa. And and his dad even says, hey, you're not supposed to do that. There's nobody in your country in here about this. And this isn't a racist issue. This was a covenant issue. They were supposed to be set apart as a covenant people for God. He says, look, don't, don't don't mix the holy with the unholy is what God is trying to tell them. But instead of listening to sound advice, Samson allows his lustful desire to rule his heart and mind. And he fell victim to something that we all struggle with, don't we? Will versus desire. Throughout our lives, throughout your life, you're going to desire unhealthy things. You're going to desire sinful things, prideful things, lustful things, greedy things. You, you, You will... You will have a a war waging inside of you of of your fleshly desire versus your will, versus God's will for your life. And the battle is not to give in to that sinful nature. Then this is a situation we, we find ourselves right now here in our culture because our culture tells us to go for success at all costs, doesn't it? It, it, it says money is king, pleasure is king. It says whatever you can do to make yourself happy, to make yourself feel good, to, to make you, to get you to the top, you do it at all costs, right? The culture is pushing us and telling us that it is completely acceptable to allow each and every desire to have its full potential. And that anyone who tells you otherwise, anyone who tries to limit what, what you think is pleasurable, they're a bigot and they're judgmental. And we've seen the extent that this has gone in our world. I, I, I recently, I read this article. This is not a joke. I read an article the other day where a woman in Britain was trying to marry a ghost. And, and they had people in the comment section fighting for her right to marry the ghost. I don't know if she saw him or not. I, I, don't, I don't know, Holly.
But it, it's just strange to me. It's, it's interesting to me that, that it really has become fully acceptable in our culture. That it is okay to go after any desire with no hesitation, with no pullback, with no thought to the consequences to ourselves or to those around us. You will have temptation in your life. There's no getting around that. We still live in a fallen world. We're still fallen. We're still sinful people. We still feel the effects of sin in our lives. Let me ask you this morning. I want you to pull back the curtain of your heart for just a moment. What desires are trying to rule your life and your heart and your mind right now? You say, well, they're not bad. I didn't, I didn't say bad. Just what desires do you have ruling your heart and mind right now? What, what is trying to take precedent for you? What are you setting up there that maybe you've taken something good You've taken something that God has blessed you with, but you've moved it to a status that's unhealthy and, and unwise. Maybe it is a sinful desire. Have you found yourself entertaining this in your mind, on your drive to work, while you watch television, when you lie down at light, night? Beloved, can I give you some advice? Don't. Don't allow sinful desires to live long in your mind because it doesn't take long for them to be in our mind before we start trying to find ways to play them out in our lives. And we're going to have to decide whether we're going to give in to the lusts of the flesh which leads to death or to submit our desires to Christ and rely on the sound advice of the Word of God and the power of the Spirit of God to defeat that temptation. So he has these lustful desires versus sound advice. Skip down to verse 4. We're going to see God's plan in relation to our sin. Verse 4, however, his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord, for he was seeking an occasion against the Philistines. Now, at that time, the Philistines were ruling over Israel. Then Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came as far as the vineyards of Timnah. And behold, a young lion came roaring toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily so that he tore him as one tears a young goat. Though he had nothing in his hand, but he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. So he went down and talked to the woman, and she looked good to Samson. When he returned later to take her, he turned aside to look at the carcass of the lion, and behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the body of the lion. So he scraped the honey into his hands and went on eating it as he went. When he came to his father and mother, he gave some to them, and they ate it, but he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey out of the body of the lion. You ever done something kind of dumb, kind of shady, wasn't really completely thought out, and then it, you were surprised that the results turned out better than what you thought they were going to turn out? I, I, I remember I was with my cousin and, and my brother. We were uh, on, on my uncle's dairy farm, and it was in between Milkins, and we were just bored. And so we went out, and we decided that, you know, there's a silo there, and it's probably 100 foot high. We decided, hey, we, we had never seen the top of the silo, so let's go check out the top of the silo. We're probably 10, 11 years old, maybe 12 at this time. So, so we just, we start climbing up the silo. We go up the silo and we get up there and we were like, we could see the whole farm from there. We could see what everybody was doing. We could see all the cows. We could see the pigs. And we just, we took a nap on top of the silo and just hung out. It was great. And then on, on the way down, we, we, were, we were going down and we, and we realized that the ladders was actually doors into the silo. Now we could open the ladder and we could see down to the silo. And we're like, oh, look, there's feed down there. And we're like, when we're, when we're sitting there, wondering, we're like, I wonder if we could jump from here and land in the feed in the silo. And we're going through this, Miss Nelka. We're thinking this through. And, you know, we're, 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 we're three young, smart 12-year-olds. <laughs> and so we're about 50 foot up, about halfway down. And so we decide we open two of these doors, these ladder doors. We open. We just jump. We just dive into the silo. Brother Tim, we just go after it, head first into the silo. Not head first. We just dive. And we realized we hit that grain, and, and there's something we didn't know as 12-year-old kids. That silo hadn't been used in many years. That grain was moldy. It was nasty. It was stinky. It was funky. But there was something else that we realized while we were down there in that silo with just a little bit of light. We, there was no way to open the silo from the inside. We were stuck. And we were stuck in there for several hours just, just hanging out with the feed, Right? And, and, and it was for long, people came looking for us. And so we heard them yelling, so we was banging on the side of the silo. And they got us open us up. But what was really cool, the coolest part of the whole story, it ended up being a blessing. 
When they opened up the silo, we realized that they had used it to dump stuff in. And so there was like all kind of old toys. There were model airplanes and stuff in there that we had to get to put together. And so we ended up being a really dumb decision. It turned out to be kind of cool for us. Not so much for mom and dad, but, you know, we, we liked it. This is kind of the situation we find in verses 4 through 9. The author lets us know, this is really important, this is really key. The author lets us know that, that God is using and even going to redeem Samson's unwise decision, Samson's sin for his glory. You see, the two nations at this time were so intertwined that Israel did not have an identity. And this is a problem. Because if Israel didn't have an identity, then they couldn't be the people of God. If Israel didn't have an identity, they didn't have the Hebrew language, they couldn't translate the Old Testament, they couldn't translate the law to their children, so they could not raise children to worship our Lord, which means God's plan that he set way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it was not going to be fulfilled because they had no identity, they had no purpose, they didn't know who they were. Because they were so intertwined in the culture. It sounds a lot like the church today sometimes, doesn't it? And so what God does is he uses Samson's sin to end up. We're going to see Samson's sin of going down to Timnah, of seeing this, uh, this, this Philistine woman, of wanting to marry her. It ends up causing a blood feud between the Israelites and the Philistines and causing them to fully separate, therefore gaining their identity back. Well, God, God can even use a crooked stick, can he? We must always remember that God is righteous and God is just. He can and will use both the sinful and the righteous for his purposes and even his judgment. He does this with Samson's lust. He uses Samson's lust to enact judgment upon the Philistine people. But what's interesting is on the way there to pick up his bride or, or, or to, to go to get ready for the, the engagement feast, they had a week-long engagement feast there. He sees a lion. A lion goes attacking. The Spirit of the Lord fills him. He tears the lion in two. But in doing so, he automatically breaks his Nazarite vow already because he's touching a dead carcass. So he goes, does some stuff in Timnan. He's going back home. He sees the lion again. There's a, a beehive in there. I didn't know bees like dead lions, but apparently they do. So he reached down there and he scoops this out. Again, what does he do? Violates his Nazarite vow. Touching a dead body, he goes and he tells mom and daddy, hey, check out this honey. How would you like to know you just ate honey out of a dead lion? Right? He conveniently leaves that out. Notice in verse 7, look at verse 7. Some very key words here. It says, he went down the tent and he saw this woman and she looked good to Samson. See, Samson was ruled by the lust of his eyes. He was ruled by the lust of his eyes. He was a man who would do anything to satisfy his flesh. And at the end of Samson's story, we're going to see it actually cost him his life. Church, the reason this is important to mention, because if we allow our eyes or our passions to rule us without being filtered through the word of God, without the spirit of God guiding us, if we allow our passions to simply rule us unchecked, we will suffer. You say, well, why is that? Because the desires of the flesh are to glorify the flesh. The desires of the flesh are to glorify the flesh. So whatever passion we have, even though they might be good, their ultimate aim is to always make us look good and put us up. And that's exactly opposite of what the Word of God tells us we should be doing. What happens is we take even good things. They can be sins, but they can be good. But we take them and what we do, we idolize. We turn our passions, our desires into idols. And we do this with all sorts of things. We do this with our jobs. We do this with our houses. We do this with our families. Parents, I'm going to go ahead and throw this out there. Sometimes we idolize our own children. We, 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 we put our children on such a pedestal and we, we revolve our whole lives around them as if they are God in our lives and not the Lord Jesus Christ. We can take all sorts of things and, and, and make them idols in our lives, but God will not tolerate idols. God will bring ruin to the false idols in our lives in order to bring ourselves back to him. And you may be here this morning, you know exactly, when I say this word, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've made an idol out of a particular passion or desire or sin in your life, and you find yourself ruled by that. Can I ask you just a plain question? This is something I ask, I ask my kids and I ask myself. Why do I continue doing that which I know is wrong? Why? Why am I continuing this sinful habit or this sinful lifestyle that I know, I know will hurt me in the end? 
Some time has passed from Samson's proposal to this woman. He goes back home, and like we said, he feeds his family his own sin. He literally feeds his family sin. But God's going to use him. God's going to redeem him. But what we're going to see, even in God's grace and his blessings, Samson continually turns aside from the Lord to pursue his own passions. And it's keeping him from being used fully by the Lord. What about you this morning? Is your sin keeping you from being used effectively as God could use you? Maybe there's something in your life that you wouldn't consider sin, but you know that because of this thing, this person, this relationship, this activity, this habit, this thought pattern, you know it's keeping you from being used the way God wants to use you. Let's look at the verses 10 through 14. We're going to see some reason versus riddles. Look at verse 10. Then his father went down to the woman, and Samson made a feast there for the young men. Customarily did this. This is engagement feast is happening. When they saw him, they brought 30 companions to be with him. So the Philistines brought 30 of their people to be with Samson in this feast. Then Samson said to them, let me now propound a riddle to you. If you will indeed tell it to me when the seven days of the feast within the seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you 30 linen wraps and 30 changes of clothes. But if you are not able to tell me, then you shall give me 30 linen wraps and 30 changes of clothes. And they said to him, propound your riddle that we may hear it. So he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat and out of the strong came something sweet, but they could not tell the riddle in those three days. Now the scene shifts to this pre-wedding or engagement feast. Samson has the prize of his lust, this Philistine woman, and now he wants not sex, but he desires material possessions. So he uses this riddle of which only he could know the answer to. He uses this riddle to try to trick these people into getting a whole bunch of clothes, getting a bunch of material wealth. He's worried about the material. He has the lust of the eyes, the flesh. He has the sex taken care of. Now he wants the stuff in his life. And he's using dishonest means to acquire wealth he doesn't need for a marriage he isn't supposed to be in. He's doing the best he can to justify his sinfulness and to increase his own status in his own eyes and those around him. He doesn't know he's in trouble. He's just making it worse. You know, you can chew gum. You can blow bubbles with it. I've even used it to make sticky adhesive on stuff before. You know? I read a story the other day about this little girl. She was playing with some gum. She blew some bubbles. She got the gum in her hair. But instead of telling her mom and dad, she tried to get it out herself. And, and she used some stuff. She, she used brushes and she went in the bathroom with it. And when she got finished, her hair was this giant rat nest of gum. And then she went to her dad and said, Dad, I got a problem. Was like, oh, my goodness. He had this special solvent. He, he, he spent hours and hours trying to get it out of her hair without having to cut her hair. And he finally got it all out. And he had a little bit of solvent left in the bottle. And the little girl was, was really excited. She said, oh, good. Now we have some left, left in case it happens again. <laughs> See, so sometimes we just don't get it. He's already made one foolish decision with the lust. And now he's getting himself even deeper into it. We all make a mess of things when we lean on our own understanding. And it only gets worse when we don't learn from the messes we create. See, Samson tries to use his own wisdom to advance his own sinfulness. Beloved, we as the people of God, we are called to be holy, set apart from the world. We are not to do the things the world does. We're not to chase the things the world chases We have an identity in Christ Jesus. Let us be followers of Christ. Let us use our gifts and our talents, our resources, our time. Let them use them for his glory and not our own. Look at verse 15 with me. We see some deception within this situation now. Then it came about on the fourth day that they said to Samson's wife, entice your husband so that he will tell us the riddle or we will burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us to impoverish us? Is this not so? Samson's wife wept before him and said, you only hate me and you don't love me. You have propounded a riddle to the sons of my people and have not told it to me. And he said to her, behold, I've not told it to my father and mother. So should I tell you? 
However, she wept before him seven days while the feast lasted. On the seventh day, he told her because she pressed him so hard. She then told the riddle to the sons of her people. So the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. Oh, snap. Verse 19, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he went down to Ashkelon and killed 30 of them and took their spoil and gave the changes of clothes to those who told the riddle. And his anger burned, and he went up to his father's house, but Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his friend. So the engagement lasts seven days. On the seventh day, the marriage was supposed to be consummated. The price of these gar- uh, garments was expensive. The Philistine men did not want to part with that. They didn't have the money. They flat out didn't have the money. They, they agreed to a bet that they, did, they couldn't feel their side of it. So they threatened Samson's fiance to get the answer. At first, Samson refused, but after a week of crying and begging, he gives her the answers, knowing full well she's going to give it to the Philistines. His relationship with this woman is endemic of how sin works in our life. See, first this woman entices him, then she controls him, and then she betrays him. That is exactly what sin does in our life. It entices us, just just come try a little bit. It then controls us, it literally gets its hooks in us where we cannot get out. And then it betrays us, promising us one thing and delivering instead. Always, sin always delivers death. Sin deceives intentionally in order to control us. It's interesting to me as I read this story, especially in chapter 14. Samson can kill lions and break ropes, but he can't overcome a woman's tears. These Philistines, they answer Samson's riddle and he accuses them of cheating. He doesn't have to, but he upholds his side of the agreement. He goes down to Ashkelon, 20 miles away, kills 30 men, takes their clothes, brings them back. He's so angry, he doesn't even consummate his own marriage, but goes back to his parents' house after killing these 30 men, and then his would-be dad-in-law gives away his fiancée to his best man. You can't make this stuff up. This is daytime television right here. What's sad is throughout this whole episode, from the very first verse to the last, we see a man ruled by sinful passions which lead to unwise decisions that lead to unwise decisions. And his unwise decisions do not only affect him. Notice this. His foolishness, his selfishness, his pride has a dangerous impact on all those around him. We often can justify ourselves in our own eyes for our own actions. We, 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 we can make a line in the sand and we'll stand there and we'll proudly fight for whatever we want. And even if, even if we know we're sinful, we're not going to give up, we're not going to back down. But we often fail to realize that our pride, our arrogance, our stubbornness, our selfishness, our idolatry, it does not simply impact us. It impacts and harms those around us, those that we love and those that we care about. It would be enough if Samson was the only one that suffered these consequences. But his selfishness, his pride, his lust led to the suffering of others. Has your sin ever caused harm to someone else? Sure it has. Absolutely. If you say no, then either you don't understand the nature of man or you don't understand the nature of sin. Our sin by nature affects other people because we by nature are in to be in relationship with other people. Since we are built to be in relationship with the people, our sin has a direct impact of the people that we share a relationship with. Maybe you're here and you're allowing sin to deceive you this morning. Are you noticing the effects of unrepentant sin in your life and in the lives of those you love? We don't deceive ourselves into thinking our sin, no matter how small, it stays in itself. Sin finds a way not just to invade our lives, but it finds a way to invade the lives of those we love. And I guarantee you it will. You say, well, what's the out? How how do I fix it? The Bible is simple. We do what Samson didn't do. See, Samson was a forerunner. He he was showing that we needed a full deliverer. He was an impartial. He was an imperfect. He was was only a short-time deliverer, but he was pointing to the perfect deliverer, which is the person of Jesus Christ. You say, well, what does that mean for me? It means simply that you turn to Jesus Christ. You say, was my life going to be perfect? Absolutely not. 
Am I still going to battle sin? Yes, you will. But the difference is that when we turn to Christ, we have power to defeat the sin that is within us. My question is, would you allow Christ to give you the power to overcome sin today? Jesus comes and he frees you from sin. And he offers you the power to overcome your sin. Behind the scenes of an Arizona circus, Bob Bell started chatting with a man who trains the animals for Hollywood movies. And he says, how is it that you can stake a, a, a five-ton elephant with the same size stake that you can put down a baby elephant with? He says, it's easy. He said, when they're babies, we stake them down. They try and try to tug away. 10,000 times they try to tug away from that, but they can't do it. And at some point, their, their elephant memory kicks in when they get older. And, and what they knew to hold them back, what they knew to keep them in prison, what they knew thought had power of them when they were little, in their minds, it still has power over them as an adult. They can't get away from the stake. We're sometimes like that, aren't we? Something in our past can cause us so much grief, so much pain, so much anger, so much fear that it literally paralyzes us from ever reaching our full potential in Jesus Christ. Beloved, I want you to know that you are capable of much more than you ever realized. You're far more capable in Jesus Christ than you were 12 months ago. You're far, going to be far more capable next year in Jesus Christ than what you're capable of today. You cannot imagine what God wants to do with you and through you for his glory. As our team comes this morning, as they come and they're going to lead us in singing, I want to ask if you would stand with me as we get ready to close this morning. Maybe you're here and you say, Preacher, I've made some pretty poor decisions. I'm guilty of some unwise decisions. I'm guilty of some sinful decisions. And maybe, maybe you're here and you have allowed those past decisions to lead you to think that you can only make more bad decisions. That you're stuck and you cannot get out. You've sinned and that sin has brought you shame and it's brought you guilt. You found yourself in a pattern of sin and it just keeps birthing sin. And you think you can't do anything other than make bad decisions. You think you can't do anything other than sin. When I'm here to tell you one good piece of news is that you can't fix yourself. You say, how is that good news? Because once you know you can't fix yourself, you can turn to the one who can. And that's Jesus. I've tried many times to fix things in my own life on my own strength and my own wisdom. And I promise you I have failed every single time. I'm a person who's who's been broken by my own sin. I'm a person who's broken other people because of my own sin. And it's only when I've turned to Jesus Christ that I've found resolution in that. And I want to encourage you to turn to Christ this morning. Whether you're turning to him for the first time or for the 10,000th time, turn to him. Experience the fountain of his grace. As his grace comes to wash over your sin and, and redeem every decision you ever made, he can redeem it for you, his glory and your good. His grace is here to conquer your past, your bad decisions, and your sin. There is salvation and there is freedom in Jesus Christ. In just a moment, I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing together. And as we're singing, I want to encourage you to allow the Spirit of God and the Word of God to minister to your heart this morning. And as Jesus is drawing near to you, I just encourage you to draw near to him this morning. Father God, thank you for the time you've given us this morning. Thank you for your holy word. God, we fully admit that we are sinful people. God, we fully admit we make mistakes on a regular basis. We fully admit that we cannot do anything to save ourselves, but outside of Jesus Christ we're headed straight for hell it's only by your grace it's only by your mercy it's only by the death of Jesus and and recognizing that our sin is forgiven in Christ that we have a fresh start that we are forgiven so God I ask in your power this morning by the power of your spirit the power of your word that you would speak to our hearts this morning For those who don't have a relationship with you, God, I pray that you would convict them of their sin and show them the hope that is in Jesus Christ. God, for those who are battling this morning unwise decisions, God, I ask 
that you show them, God, that while their effects may be negative in their life, you can renew and restore. They don't have to stay trapped in their sins, God. Help them see that this morning. Father, glorify yourself in Jesus' name.